Great. Okay. We will start with our last uh, last module, the last stretch here. Um, so this module, uh, Monica is going to teach the first half, and I'm going to teach the second half. Um, this is sort of a newer module for us, so bear with us a little bit. Um, it's covering both some advanced statistics and machine learning. And so, you know, CBW has a whole workshop on machine learning and it has a whole workshop about, you know, statistics. So obviously it's a bit to cover in an hour, but the hope with this one is to sort of, um, you know, get you exposed to some of these ideas. Uh, and then, you know, during the lab also get you a chance to sort of see it's not super scary maybe, or maybe it is, but it's not super scary. Uh, but then I think with this module, it's fair to say that this is the one you'd probably need to really, you know, do a bit more on your own compared to some of the other modules. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we'll obviously try to fill in the blanks as much as possible. Still ask questions. Um, we'll see how it goes. All right. Well, then with that, Monarch, you, you can talk about Good. So as Morgan said, I'm going to be doing kind of the first half of the lecture. We're going to be talking mostly about statistics and statistical modeling, and then he'll take it over and do the machine learning part. Um, so again, this is, these we're we're going to be talking about statistical modeling, um, and we're going to be mostly. It's not really going to be a very technical lecture. We're mostly going to be introducing some general concepts. Um, and frameworks uh, that are really kind of the basis of a lot of statistical methods um, and really how can you can extend that to your own data, your own research questions. Um, should hopefully it'll be quite valuable. Um, again, like microbiome data, as tedious and as complicated as it is, um, it's really just another type of data. And a lot of the um, statistical tools that are used in microbiome analysis rely on these frameworks and understanding them isn't only just important to understand your methods, it's as important with everyone, everything, but it helps gives you the flexibility and the ability to kind of um, extend these different frameworks um, to your specific research questions. Um, oh, so well, I'll be the first ones up here. So we're just gonna introduce some first concepts about statistical inferences and uh, hypothesis testing, which is kind of how we understand statistics and how it's really taught to us. Um, then we're going to kind of talk about linear models, which is this basic framework on which a lot of other methods are based on. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, generalized linear models, mixed models, um, which extend this linear model framework um, to different types of data. Again, we're really just trying to provide an intuitive and practical understanding of these underlying concepts, and we're not necessarily going to be going into a lot of detail in, into anything else. Morgan, do you want to talk about your points, or should we just... Yeah. I'll just read them. So, general purpose of machine yeah. learning, how we understand machine learning models are trained and validated to get that idea in your head. And since ran and forth, are used a lot with uh, microbiome data. We're going to talk about that one specifically just a bit more uh, and how you sort of interpret the accuracy of machine learning. There we go. That's what we will be doing. Um, so what we're doing with statistics and what inference really is, is we're trying to understand population level dynamics from our sample data from our specific experiment. That's what we're doing in science and as in statistics kind of just gives you that mathematical mathematical framework to validate, um, formally validate uh, those hypotheses that we make from our experiments um, to the population level. The way this is traditionally done, which is probably what most of you guys, what we've all really been taught, is kind of by formulating those null and alternative hypotheses. Uh, the null hypothesis kind of being the one that we want to disprove. There are no differences between our groups and the alternative hypothesis um, being that there are these sort of differences. You formulate the hypothesis and then you choose a test statistic. The, the various, there's lots of different types according to your data characteristics. Um, and F, this the mathematical framework essentially gives you a p-value where it allows you or tells you with what confidence can we accept or reject that null hypothesis generally at that kind of threshold, magical threshold of 0 0.05. Um, now this, this, this is kind of the how we've all really been told how to do it. Um, but statistics has is still a rapidly evolving field, and this is by no means the only way that we can really do it. Now, if you were, if I were my um 
introductory Bayesian analysis prof. I would go on a 15-minute uh, minute rant about how statistics was really invented 150 years ago by eugenicists, and we need to completely bury that. We need to move on and never look back. Now, that's not really the point of this lecture, um, but just so you know, this there are other ways to do things, and um, it's a field that's really changing all the time. There's lots of really interesting ideas that are still being discussed and debated, um, and there's a lot of stuff really going on, and it's by no means the bile end all. Now, a lot of us, we've always, we've seen um, these types of flow charts a lot of the time, which um, we're basically, we are able to, this kind of tells us, what kind of test statistic um, do we pick based on the nature of our data? Is our outcome variable uh, continuous, categorical? So then we, you know, depending on the types of predictor variables, we go on and we, you know, pick what sort of tests we could have. We've got parametric versions of these tests, We've got non-parametric versions of these tests. Um, and these can be quite useful, like in certain simple scenarios, um, you know, the, 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 these tests can give us information about our data and can help us kind of reject or accept that null hypothesis, depending on what the um, results are, right? And in, in simple um, frameworks, they can be useful, um, but they are also not very, they, they can also be kind of limited in the information they can really give us. Um, we're really not gonna work, work through um, the flowchart itself. Um, but again, it kind of helps us think about what is the nature of our data, uh, what is our outcome variable, whatever predictor variables or exposure variables as they're called here, um, what's kind of the distribution, is it normal, is it not normal, and these are all things that we still need to do um, in other frameworks, uh, data and analytical frameworks, and they're always good to have handy and in simple scenarios, they can be quite helpful. Um, now, there's, you might have heard, there's definitely lots of problems with hypothesis testing in itself. Again, hypothesis testing kind of revolves about this idea of kind of extracting this magical p-value, um, which yeah, it'll tell us if our hypothesis is sort of correct or not. But this over, like, emphasizing p-values this way has kind of, you know, has definitely this over we overemphasize it and we put too much um, value in it and that can be fairly misleading it can also lead us to things like p hacking where we kind of modify our data or modify our analysis just to get this magical threshold this magical significance threshold um, and that can be problematic for obvious reasons um, hypothesis testing also is an issue when you're doing a lot of different comparisons which we've talked about a little bit um, this is the, definitely a thing in microbiome data since it's uh, so high dimensional. Um, we're usually carrying out lots of different hypothesis tests and then we need to correct for this. Um, and this can also be problematic for different reasons, um, which is why we're always encouraged to not just report this magical p-value. It's always important to visualize your data, see what the actual differences are, report confidence intervals around uh, the estimates that we generate talk about effect sizes, which is kind of the magnitude of the differences uh, between two groups, compare different models. Um, this is also why Bayesian, Bayesian frameworks have become really quite popular as they kind of move away from emphasizing those p-values and instead give, you know, kind of how, how sure, how, what, what the uh, confidence is around our estimates, and they definitely become quite popular. However, hypothesis testing is still very widely used by lots of people, including me and lots of people. Um, and they do provide a systematic way of evaluating our scientific findings and comparing results. Um, so we're gonna talk about linear models. Uh, linear models are the foundation of many statistical methods. They're very flexible and versatile methods, uh, models used in many fields. We often think of linear models, we go straight to linear regression, for example, um, which is the case when both our outcome and our predictor variables are continuous. Um, but for example, ANOVAs are really just linear models uh, with a continuous uh, outcome and categorical predictors. And what linear models are really just, um, what they're kind of analyzing, what we're trying to do with these linear models is what is the effect of X on Y? And we can have lots of different X's. Um, and again, these, and yeah, this, that's kind of the general idea behind them. What are the effect of all these different variables on our variable of interest? 
Um, again, this can just be one covariate, but we can include lots of different variables in our model. And this is kind of what we do when we're controlling for different variables. Um, Sometimes, like we may be interested in a lot of these, um, we may be interested in the effects of a lot of these covariates and we would look at their estimates in more detail. Uh, but often we just kind of want to subtract the effect. For example, if we're controlling for sex, we can include uh, sex in the model um, and that will kind of subtract the variability of that effect on Y so we can more specifically look at our covariates of interest, subtracting um, the, the effect of the variables that we are controlling for. If we have lots of variables, for example, and I guess Morgan will go into more detail about this um, as it's made more of an issue in machine learning, regularization methods such as ridge or lasso regression, um, they can help prevent multicollinearity, which is basically when two of our predictor variables are correlated with each other and they shouldn't really be included in the model together. Um, and this can lead to overfitting, not really necessarily what we're gonna be talking about. Any questions? If anyone has any questions at any point, please let me know. Cool. So this is, this is kind of the linear model, what we're looking at here, which is basically evaluating um, the effect of all these different predictor or It's evaluating our response variable as a function of our different predictor variables. We can include several of these. Um, and again, these can be categorical or, or continuous. Um, again, we have our intercept, always part of the model, and we have the error term at the end, which is essentially capturing um, the variability that is not captured by the rest of our predictors. Then we have our betas being our parameters. This is really what we're interested in um, when we apply these methods. And it will tell us this is when we're trying to estimate these parameters. This is what the math behind uh, the different methods do. Um, and we're trying to capture what is the effect, what's the magnitude of the effect of each of these predictors on our outcome variable Y. Any questions? Just like with any statistical methods, um, linear models um, have some assumptions that need to be met. Um, once the, if these assumptions are met, then we can reliably use a mathematical framework of interest, and this will change depending on the specific method to estimate those model parameters. If the assumptions aren't met, then we can't really um, rely on the estimates and the values that we're going to get may be probably familiar with most of these um, assumptions. The first one I will point out is independence, of course, it just, and it's pretty much one of the most important ones. Violating the assumption of independence um, can cause some serious problems in our data, such as pseudo-replication. We'll talk about what to do when we do find dependencies in our data. Uh, then, of course, linearity. There should be a linear relationship between our predictor variables and our response variables. Homoscedasticity, if which is a fun word to say. Uh, ooh, what, what, I think it's the variance of the, and again, these um, assumptions mostly apply to the errors and the residuals. And it's the variance, uh, I believe, uh, the variance of the residuals should not change along the, um, I, I don't know how to explain that properly. It's okay. Um, and then normality of the errors. And we'll talk about what happens when our data isn't necessarily normally distributed. Um, pardon? We're gonna talk about that zero values. We'll definitely, um, we're not gonna talk about it super in depth, but uh, they definitely make the data non-normally distributed. They do need to be accounted for. There's zero inflated models that are able to do this. <clears throat> Um, definitely an issue with microbiome data, having as many zeros as they have. Um, and there is a point, and I'll make it now, might as well. Um, not all data, just because there are a lot of zeros, it's not necessarily means that they are zero inflated. Um, and it's, there are ways to formally test for zero inflation. And a lot of people easily apply zero inflated models when they aren't necessarily necessary. Um, but yes, definitely that will make your data not very normal and you should use different, we'll talk about that. 
Um, so this is why model diagnostics are really important. When you fit your model, you should be looking at the residuals, for example, um, which is what these assumptions are mostly um, covering um, to see if these assumptions are being met. And a lot of the times, a lot of people don't necessarily worry too much if they're sort of kind of ballpark, don't look too crazy. But again, the assumption of independence is very important and violating that one can lead to a lot of problems. Just very briefly, we're not really going to look at anything um, in R really, or I'm giving you specific instructions, but just if you wanted to do this uh, for your analysis, the linear model function in base R, basically you give it the formula where you have your response variable, this is your outcome variable of interest, um, as a function of the predictors that you're including in your model, you point it to the data, and then the summary function, which kind of looks like this, will give you this estimate, the standard error, as well as the p-value for that estimate, basically meaning how confident are you of the value of that parameter. Any questions? Cool. So what happens when our data is not necessarily uh, normally distributed? And again, to a degree, it doesn't matter if it's not perfectly normally distributed. But in some cases, um, the it, it's not so much about the shape of the distribution of your data. It's really more about the nature of the type of data that you're analyzing. So when we have a nice continuous outcome, we can sort of use normal methods. But sometimes uh, if we have count data, for example, proportions, which basically bounded by 0 and 1, um, things like binary outcomes, obviously, which is a kind of a yes or no question. And again, zero inflation uh, will ruin their normality. So this is, these are all sort of scenarios where we can't really apply linear models. And these are where generalized linear models comes in. And they're really, this, they're very much the same idea as linear models themselves, but they are apply this, extend this framework to non-normally distributed data. These are used by various uh, differential abundance tools. Again, microbiome data is far, far away from distributed. Um, it does depend on how you choose to normalize your data, which you're going to be doing as you've talked. Data normalization is very important in a microbiome analysis. So you'd really have to think about what kind of normalization steps you've taken, um, whether you have raw count data, which as we know, isn't the best way to analyze our data. Are we using proportions? Have we carried out a CLR transformation on our data? But there's a number of different distributions that we can pick. Now, again, at the bottom, we've got our happy linear model there again. And as we can see, it really just is the same idea, but we don't, we don't have um, just why as it is. Uh, there's two more elements that are two more elements that are introduced to the linear model framework. One being the, um, the distribution of the, the, the distribution of the response variable. Um, this is represented by E and basically this framework can be extended to all distributions that belong to the exponential family. And these do include most of the ones that we're familiar with, things like Poisson or negative binomial uh, gamma distributions. These all belong to the exponential family distribution. The other thing, the other element that's part of the GLM framework is the link function, which is represented by G. We're not really going to talk about it a lot, uh, but basically it links it's a link function that links uh, the response and the um, predictor parts of the model. These can be like log links, identity links, and usually a specific distribution will have a default link function. A lot of the times they're not really ch like changed, but it is something that you can play around with. If you're well versed in these sort of methods, you know what you're doing. Um, there are different elements you can change um, that might fit your data better. Any questions about GLMs? Make sense. This is how they look in R. Um, again, very, very similar framework. We got a response, our predictor variables, and then the output um, kind of gives us this. I mean, I just have one covariate there. I just threw some stuff there just so you can see what it looks like. Um, we get our estimate, we get our p value. Um, and also bring your attention down to the AIC at the bottom. Usually that would be a number that if that means uh, infinity because I just threw whatever it was and it doesn't like it at all. Um, but that would be a number. Now, what is this? Um, you may have heard about it. Um, so the AIC or the Akaiki uh, Information Criterion um, is an indicator of relative quality of model of, of relative quality of the model given a particular data set. Uh, we're not going to go super in depth about it, but it's just kind of 
a thing to be aware of. Um, and what they're doing is um, kind of gauging your model and it gives you a way to compare different models um, that you might be trying out for your data. It's kind of a similar idea to an R squared, but the R squared doesn't really, uh, they are really not related, but they're a similar idea. Um, the R squared doesn't penalize model complexity, whereas the AIC does penalize model complexity. Um, this is this idea, and this is a kind of more related to machine learning. Morgan will talk about it. Um, but if we can, we want to always pick more simple models if we are able to. These are generally more predictive value, and it's just we want to prevent overfitting, which Morgan will talk more about. But we want our model to be generalizable to other types of data. We don't want it to fit our particular data set um, too specifically. Lower AICs indicate a better model, but we can only compare these values if we're kind of using the same data set, we're testing out different models on our data. You can't just take two models from two different data sets and say this is a better model than that one. Um, and I'll just leave this idea here. Now, again, this AIC, what it is evaluating as the predictive capability of a model. And it's something that I have a bit of an issue with. Um, and I'm talking to other people that apparently other people have issues with it too. When we're doing statistics, we're not really trying to predict anything just by building these sort of models. So why are we really using um, predictive tools? Why are we evaluating their predictive ability if we're not really um, predicting anything with it at that stage at least? And why are we using it to compare the model? Or why are we using them as a model comparison tool than when what they're evaluating is the prediction? Um, I don't have an answer to it. Just uh, thought. That's, that is how they're used, yeah. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that is how they're used. Um, but again, and uh, like, this is what, it's just something that I, like, I find jarring in my brain. I'm not going to try, like, I mean, if it's, that, that is how they're used, right? And they do give you a way to evaluate different models and compare them. I'm not going to tell you not to do that, and everyone does that. Um, but it's just kind of like, and this happens a lot, and especially with microbiome tools, especially, um, a lot of them are prediction based and a lot of differential abundance tools exist, but what they're doing is they're implementing machine learning to understand two groups together. But like, if we're not trying to predict anything, we're just differential abundance and prediction are different things, right? And you got power to go. Yeah. For sure. For sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. That is how they're used. Exactly, right? That they are usable in that way, right? But it's prediction and statistics in my brain are two different things, yeah, right? And it's, but but yeah, they are used and they do provide that framework. Um, and it it is important to compare models in that way and remove variables that are not that shouldn't be there, right? And you can definitely do this with way. Um, cool. Any questions about that? How are we doing for time? Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, so now we're going to talk about mixed effect models, and this is where this violation of the assumption of independence come in. Um, so mixed effect models are also known as hierarchical or multi-level models. Again, with everything, they all have different names. Everybody calls it a different thing, but they really are um, referring to the same idea. So mixed effect models um, extend this linear uh, model framework to clustered data. And clustered data are very important to acknowledge as such because they violate the assumption of independence. Uh, again, this assumption of independence means that the value of an, of an observation should not be dependent on the value of a different observation. Um, and when we have clustered data that creates correlations within the data, correlation structures um, that need to be acknowledged by the model. Um, clustered data, for example, you can think the classic example is uh, studying, for example, different children within specific classrooms, within specific schools. Kids within classrooms within kids within the same classroom are going to be more similar to kids from a different classroom. Same with the classrooms within the schools. Um, but essentially, data that come from the same source are going to be more similar to each other um, than those that don't. 
Another very important um, example of cluster data is longitudinal or repeated measures data, which are very common. They're very valuable studies, and it's important that we analyze them as such. And in this case, it's the individuals that each subject is going to be a specific cluster and measurements that come from that specific individual um, are going to be more related than observations that come from a different person. Um, now, mixed effect models are very powerful, very flexible models um, that are can model uh, very complex data structures. Um, and they're also really good at, um, at, at, at working with missing data. They're able to overcome that. Um, and they're very, very powerful, very, um, very, very interesting models. Um, but and it is important to know how to use them correctly and or just, you know, don't, yeah, you start, start simple and always work your way up. Um, and mixed effect models also come in the linear model framework if you are if you have normal data and they come in the generalized linear mixed model framework if you have non-normally distributed data. Um, so again, we've got our linear model there. And basically the structure of these mixed effect models is it separates um, our predictors into either fixed effects or random effects. Now the fixed effects are kind of our regular component of the model there, um, where we have our covariates. Um, some of them might be of interest, some of them we might just be controlling for. And then the random effects kind of, they model the correlation structures that might be occurring within the error term that we have in our model. And this is where we could we, we, we would include um, the clusters that, that we're looking into. Now it's not necessarily super um, straightforward to know if something's gonna be a fixed effect or a random effect. Sometimes there's really no correct answer to that. And you just kind of have to think about it and play around with different things. Um, but some general rules of thumb, generally your fixed effects are the variables of interest that you're gonna be looking at, um, things that you're controlling for, factors with if, if your fact, if there's not a lot of levels from the factor, there's all a, a set number of them, they would be a fixed effect. And then the random effects, um, if they're kind of like a random subsampling of the population, this is where we would account for the cluster variability. If we're not really interested in the parameters, then we would include that variable as a random effect. Um, now, random effect structures can get pretty complex. Here, we're just kind of, this is kind of the most simple version of it, where we're basically saying that um, each cluster is going to have its own intercept. Um, but you can include random slopes for each of your clusters. These are random effects can be nested and crossed. And they can get, they can get pretty crazy pretty quick, um, which is where the flexibility and power of these models really come in. And they're able to do a lot of different things. Any questions about mixed effect models? Um, so in R, there are several different packages um, that work with mixed effect models. The kind of classic one is LME4. This includes the lemur function, uh, which would be the linear mixed effect model, as well as the GLMR, which would be the generalized linear mixed effect version of this. There's NLME, um, include, they all kind of, each depending on what you're doing, you would use different packages. I think NL, NLME is for non-linear mixed effects, uh, but it also includes lim, uh, mixed effect, or linear ones and does different things. GLMM, TMB, DMB is a uh, group of packages and they just kind of offer more functionality. I think a lot of the more weird distributions um, are included in TMB. So if like if your distribution isn't included in lemur, you can probably find it in the GLMM TMB. We've got MCMC GLMMs if you wanna try out doing some Bayesian, Bayesian versions of this. Um, then MGCV is also uh, a very powerful R package that has lots of different options. So just for the kind of more basic version of this, the classic function is uh, lemur, uh, where we have a response or predictor, just like the rest of the versions of this. Um, and then this is kind of how we would um, frame our, our random effect structure. So again, each of these participants, for example, if we were to have a longitudinal study, we're letting all of their, their intercepts um, vary, but they would have a fixed slope in this case. Um, that's just kind of how it look at looks like. Um, now, lemur doesn't compute p-values automatically. Um, computing p-values in mixed effect models isn't is apparently not super straightforward. 
Um, but the lemur test, our package provides a summary function that does compute these p-values um, based on Satterwerther's method um, for calculating degrees of freedom. I think it, the, calculating the degrees of freedom in mixed effect models is apparently not that straightforward. Uh, so again, this is kind of how the output looks. Um, this Remmel criterion at convergence is kind of the AIC version of the mixed effect models, um, something you can look at. And then you've just got your uh, different parameters there um, with their estimates, various levels of significance. You got a fun interaction effect, which we're not really gonna be talking about interaction effects, uh, but you can definitely include those. Um, so again, all these outputs kind of look similar and you know they are kind of extending the same framework to different types of data. Any questions? How would someone decide whether they would do a lemur versus a it will depend on if you pardon you could yes you would that was a way to formally test for your uh for your data i mean yeah and even and it really depends on who you ask i mean if it, your data is obviously not normally distributed it, there's there's levels of it right it doesn't there is no necessarily one specific cutoff and in a lot of ways because the linear like the not the generalized just the linear frameworks are more simple in a lot of ways they can be preferred um and it's the way it was and again this is what we we're talking about at the very beginning of the first day you know it's all these it's balancing facts and opinions as well right no one's gonna just have there's no right or way wrong or right or wrong way to do things. And again, yeah, data analysis is more of an art than a science in a lot of ways. Um, the normality one, and it's more, the normality one can be kind of fluctuating. I'm not gonna tell you to violate the assumption of normality, um, but it's more so based, not so much the shape of the distribution of your data. It's more what kind of data, you, if you're using counts or if you're using proportions. Um, or if you have like a binomial, it's it's more the nature of your response variable, but some other person might have strong opinions on some about something else. Any other questions? I was briefly going to mention about like additive models, and they come in the generalized flavor as well as the mixed flavor. Um, these are called GAMs. They also exist, they're used to model non-linear relationships between your outcome and your predictor variables, the use of spline functions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, they do exist if you know that you do have a non-linear relationship, but a lot of the time, don't really, don't, the only thing I'll say, don't use them unless you really have to, because they are complicated, not just to implement, but just a lot of the time, they really just are overkill, um, and there's better ways to analyze your data. Um, I had some scenarios in here where we could just kind of like talk about how we would go about um, analyzing these sort of things. This isn't supposed to like provide answers for you, but just kind of thinking about what type of data you have, what kind of, what's your research question. But if we don't really have time, the answers are kind of on the next few slides. You can kind of look through them. Take time. We should take the time. No, are you sure? Yeah. It's been half an hour. This is the most interesting part. No, it's not. Maybe step to the first part. Uh, sure. I mean, so the first one, for example, if by some, and this is why we don't do it manually. This is why differential abundance tools exist that do implement, you know, developed by statisticians that know what they're doing and that account for different things in the proper way. Um, but it was like, for example, someone wanted to manually calculate differential abundance between our bulk and rhizosphere soil samples that we played around with during the first couple modules. And if someone wanted to do this uh, using raw count data, who wants to give me like some idea of a framework? How would one go about this? Does anyone have any, any things? Like what kind of data? What's raw count data? Was it normally distributed? Is it not normally distributed? Not really, right? I mean, one could argue that at some point, do the elevated number of counts, um, at some point they get kind of like normal and Poisson distributions are really just um, used for like lower counts, I guess. Um, and then if your data is over dispersed, then you would want to use a negative binomial um, distribution, for example. Uh, so, okay, imagine you know exactly how your data is normally distributed. How else would you build your model? 
So one of our covariates of interest would have to be the sample type. So it would be a categorical covariate. Um, that would either be bulk or rhizosphere soil samples. Now, one thing that we could do um, to kind of, like we know raw count data shouldn't be just analyzed as such. Um, we need to control for sequencing depth in this case, right? As we know that um, sequencing depth uh, will vary between samples and that can have obviously samples with more count or with higher sequencing depth, they're gonna have more read counts. So for example, and this is something that's, uh, this is an oversimplified version of it, but uh, some differential abundance tools um, include, instead of transforming the data to uh, normalize for sequencing depth, they would include sequencing depth as a covariate in the model. So that would be one way we could do it. Um, and then of course, uh, you, there's, you probably should account for the zero inflated nature of the data as we know uh, microbiome data has lots of zeros um, and there are zero inflated versions of these distributions um, and that could be implemented in the model for example there are a lot of differential abundance tools I don't know if they're not necessarily some of the more um, popular ones for sure um, but when you see these you know they're usually they're like ZINB sort of differential abundance tools, right? That is what they're doing. They're based on zero inflated um, models. Could you require your visuals? Most definitely, yes. You would definitely have to do that. That should be a step technically in anyone's analysis when you're modeling. Do people do it? Depends kind of what you're doing, right? Depends. Are you just analyzing your data? Are you actually trying to build a model? You know, really depends, right? Um, but yes, anyone else would have any ideas about anything? Okay, we can move on to the next one. Um, so does the abundance of gut-associated acromasia mucinophila differentiate between responders and non-responders in an immune checkpoint blockade or an immune checkpoint inhibitor clinical trial? Which we know kind of definitely, it, it has a lot of effect. Yeah, so could you, you, would that be a normally distributed response variable? No, it would like, it's not no, normal, normal, normally distributed response are continuous. And you know, this is a yes or no sort of a question, right? So we would have, sorry? Yeah, exactly. So logistic regression is kind of this GLM based framework where we have like, and again, I'm not a statistician either. And it's, I don't work with these sorts of um, results. Uh, but yeah, or a binomial uh, or a uh, GLM with a binomial distribution um, is kind of the underlying framework uh, behind um, logistic regression. But yes, exactly, right? So we would have that would be a response. And then, um, you know, we would include the abundance of acromancia mucinophila normalized, however, you're doing it. I personally would add a CLR transformation to that. Um, and that would be our predictor variable. Anyone want to add anything? Okay. Hopefully I'm not putting my foot in my mouth in too much, but it's okay. Um, and then the last one. So does the oral microbiome alpha diversity of 30 participants change over the course of a 60 day exercise intervention? And samples were taken weekly, but as it usually is the case with longitudinal studies, especially ones that go on for this long, um, there's a lot of missing time points that we don't have access to. Any ideas? Okay, and we're lo talking about longitudinal data. So in this case, we would probably want to use a mixed model approach. Um, so for example, we would include day or week, I guess, um, of X or of the study in as a uh, predictor variable. And then I guess, you know, it depends what kind of exercise, if we want to control for the type of exercise that we're doing, we could also include that in there. Uh, probably control for sex. Um, could control for a lot of other things that we could be doing. Should probably be controlling for diet as well. Um, but essentially we would use a mixed effect model um, and we would include each of the participant or participants ID as a random effect. You could do this with um, just a random intercept, but it would be expected 
that it, it wouldn't be a stretch to think that the alpha diversity of each person is going to change at a different rate during this time. So this is where one would include, for example, random slopes where we allow these parameters to kind of vary both the, in, the intercept and the slope to vary by each participant. And I know it kind of said, you know, I'm not sure and don't be scared out some things that you need to do, but these are the kind of thought processes that we follow when we're trying to analyze our data. Any questions? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so for sure, I mean, the one that needs to be there would be week of bed rest. So basically, you know, we're looking at alpha diversity on our y-axis and uh, kind of the length of the study on our x-axis. Um, so that would have to be there. And then really anything that you're controlling for, right? We can control for sex. If we have access to what they're eating, control for diets in however way, you know, in a, I don't know if there would be a simple way to do that by any stretch. Um, yeah, things like that, right? Exactly. I'm sure it get really complicated really quick. Um, but basically anything that you would want to control for would be fixed effects. Um, yeah, and there's no one size fits all. And this is why it's kind of good to understand and practice these sort of ideas. Um, it just kind of gets your brain thinking um, on how to just do the, you know, do statistical modeling, I guess. Any questions? Any further ideas? I do have those answers sort of written there. You can look at them, um, pretty much what we said. I do have some, you know, this may or may not be sort of what it would look like in R, just, and it's really not real code. It's kind of the different packages and functions you could use with sort of distribution. For example, the first one has a ZI formula. Um, that's where the zero inflation would go. Um, and that can get kind of tedious for sure. Um, and then at the bottom, and then we've got the GLM, um, where we would have that kind of logistic regression um, with treatment response and the abundance of acromancy cinephila. And then at the bottom, we've got the mixed effect models with oral diversity being the response variable. Um, treatment week would be in there, as well as any covariates that you would be including. And this is how we would model, for example, uh, both a random intercept and random slope um, for each of the participants. Not real code, just kind of some ballpark ideas. Any questions? Cool. Just to summarize, this linear model framework that we've been talking about is the basics, is the basis of many statistical methods, and you can kind of choose this to tailor uh, and tailor it to your research question. Statistics is a very rapidly evolving field, field uh, not just understanding, but also exploring and testing different methods definitely pay off, pays off in the long run. Rule of thumb, start simple, work your way up, just like really anything, honestly. Um, if you want to do some more reading or some more learning, um, this paper here, I find it's kind of a go-to paper uh, by Bokuridel, Um, and it does a really good job at walking you through some of the more technical aspects of GL GLMMs. Um, it starts easy and there's all, you know, there, it, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting if you want to get into more text, uh, technical aspects and one way, honestly, the way I kind of learned about all, a lot of this right off the, you know, just, I got introduced to it, uh, this YouTube channel, Quant Psych, he's really great at explaining this. Uh, he also has both more, way more simple, uh, um, Talks about more simple things and more complicated things, but he's very animated. He does a really great job at explaining things. Um, he comes from the field of quantitative psychology, but they're really just the same methods that we've been learning here. And he's really great. Any questions? Yeah. Pardon, can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah, that way you would use the additive models for that. Sorry. Yeah, so these ones, and again, they've, we've got additive models, um, and I've never used them. I would, yeah, I, I would have no idea how to start explaining them to you. I mean, they use spline functions or otherwise polynomial functions, all these things that are able to model uh, nonlinear relationships. 
And they kind of extend that framework to that. They are, there's generalized uh, ones if your response variable is non-normally distributed, and they also have the hierarchical or mixed version of it. Exactly, and what, yeah. The, the, you really, this should be kind of a last resort. You just shouldn't, shouldn't just assume that there's not a linear relationship between them. Um, and these, they kind of occur, I guess, more, it, well, I don't know, I don't know, actually, but so like in ecology and by when, you know, people are out in the, you know, observing animal behavior, for example, those kinds of things can have like severely nonlinear relationships. So they do have a time and a place, but for the most part, kind of stay clear of them. They do exist and they you are able to use them, but you should be using kind of the more better to sort of make your data fit a linear model. Yeah, exactly. In a way. But there there's there's usually but yeah, there's usually not that complex of a relationship between your variables that you need to do more research. Yeah. Okay. Well thank you. Great. Thank Hope you. you enjoyed that. I know that ran over a little bit, but um, yeah, I forced you to go through it. That's the most cool part, right? Test your test your knowledge, um, and that means I get to rush through mine. No. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, okay, so you heard about this, all right? So uh, machine learning is kind of like another approach of how we sort of tackle our complex data, and comes at this from a very different perspective. Uh, so machine learning is considered a subset of artificial intelligence. And unlike statistics, although the, the algorithms are complex, statistics is built a lot on, obviously, frameworks and models. And essentially, machine learning comes at it from just a pure, if you have a lot of data, you know, how can we leverage that knowledge, irrespective of trying to fit it to some, you know, model, some like linear model or anything. Um, that's probably why statisticians kind of hate machine learning. Like if you have people, they sort of go at some or from a statistics point of view, um, sort of like what uh, Monica went over and then others, you know, will sort of uh, approach it from a machine learning standpoint. The biggest caveat of machine learning is you need a lot of data. Yeah. And this comes from someone that's broken that rule before <laughs> and used maybe not uh, enough data to, to do it properly. But when I mean a lot of data, I mean a lot of samples primarily. Yeah. Because the issue is that we have a lot of features, taxa or functions, uh, but we need quite a few samples. Um, machine learning is also sort of like we just heard all about predicting outcomes, but to the extreme. At the end of the day, machine learning is all about predicting, you know, uh, an outcome, and that could be a class, it could be like a group, or it could be uh, some continuous variable. So it'd be regression. And so much so that it comes usually at the cost of not really getting information about what's driving that prediction. As we'll see later, random forest, you can get that information. But for a lot of different machine learning models, you can't go back and say, oh, wow, so I got 95% accuracy. You know, what tax are driving that high, uh, that high accuracy? It, it's essentially a black box. So machine learning is all about sort of training and prediction. Um, and so the major input to it is that it's a training data set, which includes some sort of feature table. So for our microbiome data, it would be ASVs or functions, um, it, but it could include lots of different variables. It's just features. Uh, and then the other part is obviously the thing you're trying to predict, the labels for training that data. So linking your samples, obviously to, in this case, this was disease state, so you have Crohn's disease or control, or maybe you wanna predict, uh, you know, sustained outcome versus, versus non-sustained. Uh, and essentially it's built upon those two things and you're, you're feeding that information into an algorithm uh, and essentially doing what we would say is training. So training essentially is providing the labels, you know, for the things we're trying to predict and letting it learn right learn what uh what it should how it should build the model up internally you can do lots of approaches for training the probably the classic one is five-fold cross-validation you hear about this a lot and this is just a good example but there's other types 
you would divide your set of samples into five subsets. Four subsets of that would be used for training. The uh, last fifth would be then used to say, oh, how, how did I do on that training? Let's make some changes to the model. Do that again for the other uh, four fifths over and over again. And you can then repeat the, actually the five-fold cross-validation multiple times as well. You could do um, other types of splits. You could do nine tenths or whatever you like. Uh, you can do leave one out. I'm sure there's lots of types of training and uh, testing, but essentially it's the idea of using part of your data set for training uh, and then the other parts used for seeing how well it did. I'll use the word validation and that last, the other fifth is not really validation. That's sort of a separate thing. This is sort of testing and building your algorithm up over time. Overfitting, so Monica talked about this idea and I think she actually nailed it pretty good already, but just let's hammer it home a little bit idea. This is the demise of a sensory machine learning model, right? The idea of overfitting a model is when it performs really well in your training data, but then you apply it to some other little bit of data and it doesn't do well at all. And essentially that's the result of over parameterization, overfitting essentially to your training data, right? You can imagine how many samples you have and you just keep adding more and more parameters. You can get it overfit so it looks great. And then you apply it on some other data set and you know, it just doesn't work. It's not generalizable enough. And this is probably the one thing you'll see over and over in microbiome papers <laughs> is the overfitting, even though we'll see these random forces kind of resistant to it. Uh, essentially, you know, you, you can report pretty high scores uh, by overfitting, get away with it almost. <laughs> and without a proper validation data set, you don't know if it's overfit essentially. So to, to combat that, you really have to think about going in. You can really play around with whatever your training data set is and then do a lot of stuff to it. But at the end of the day, it's kind of pointless unless you have some other validation data set to finally test it at. And you can't really cheat too much and go, oh, I'll train a whole bunch over here, test my validation set, and go back over here, train a whole bunch more, go to my validation set, because then you're just sort of artificially doing overfitting. So what is that validation data set? Maybe it's internally, maybe you split off something really inside it, uh, maybe even more meaningful and biological would be really setting up a separate data set to do the validation on. That, that would be ultimate. So for me, for human microbiome, that would mean, oh, we have like a clinical study at a hospital, we do all our stuff, and then we get another whole bunch of samples from another hospital with all that fun bias and stuff, and then we show if it actually works on that. That would be amazing. If it's an environment, maybe you've done uh, sample collection over you know, a particular scenario and you just wanna say, oh, I've built a great predictor, this looks great. My validation is gonna be set in you know, a different time or a slightly different place. Hopefully, I mean, you don't want it too different. You want it, it should be matching whatever you're trying to predict, but something that's a bit distinct from the exact same data set you just tested on. Yeah. Oh, um, so I published a paper <laughs> with uh, 20 and 20. I don't know how I get away with it. <laughs> I, I think it's too few. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't think there's a golden fast rule. I would say, um, you know, less than a hundred, like 50 and 50, if you're doing two group tests is like super bare minimum. I think if you took any real machine learning people, they'd be like, uh, no, you like, you need like thousands, <laughs> uh, and more is better. The caveat here that I always use to push back a little bit. Uh, is it depends what you're using for the model. So if you're doing it and claiming that the accuracy is the be end all of, of the reason that, that you're doing it. So you're, you know, you're saying, oh, I have a classifier at 95% accuracy. And this is the whole purpose of the paper. Then it's, you can be hypercritical of the number of samples and overfitting. That being said, with say random force, there's some interpretation of the data that we find and I, I would argue a little bit that if the interpretation of the data, essentially the features that seem to be important for that classification comes out, well, then it's just another approach to investigate your data. 
did. There's a bit of a difference there a little bit. Yeah. But the reality is this machine learning methods, you know, require a lot of data. Yeah. But you can get super accuracy with very few samples, obviously. Yeah. So there is a redundant amount of machine learning approaches. I, I this is like the worst slide I ever I know. I started to write it and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> so there's lots of different types of machine learning approaches. This is like where I'm just like, no, I'm not gonna go into detail. Uh, so we are going to talk about report uh, random forests a little bit. Uh, there's support vector machines, neural networks, but there is a lot, as you can imagine, with AI becoming super popular over time. Um, there's more deep learning approaches. So it's a very fast evolving field. If you think linear uh, linear models is fast evolving, obviously machine learning is, is very fast as well. Um, but uh, I guess for microbiome data, repetitively, I think uh, it's actually been shown to be pretty good with microbiome data. And actually, the, the reason for that is, is that it is a bit resistant. Uh, actually, it's considered quite resistant to overfitting. Uh, and because of this, I think I mentioned before, you can look at the features that are important for making the, for making the prediction. Is it worthwhile to take your training data and maybe evaluate it on a variety of different types of models? Just you could, yep. And not a quick see to look the accuracy. Um, or I guess another way to put it is the certain data favor the choice of certain things. Right. So I guess my take home message here is that if you were going to start somewhere and quite accepted for microbiome data, random forest would be pretty acceptable by reviewers. It doesn't mean that you couldn't apply other methods. And it definitely doesn't mean that computer scientists aren't looking for newer, better um, machine learning methods for microbiome data. So people have tested multiple, but then it, it, it might get a little suspect if you've done a lot and then you're, you know, you're sort of chasing your accuracy value to, to report that one. Yep. Okay, so here comes my super, super oversimplistic explanation of random forest. Um, but at the heart of random forest is a, is a tree, a decision tree, hence like a forest later on. Uh, and so a decision tree is just like you would have thought about a long time ago. It's essentially uh, an answer to a binary question, yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. And so in this example, it's just showing our ability to predict zeros and ones. Um, and in this particular case, we have a couple of features. So we know that some of these are blue and some of them are underlined. And so you can come up with a question of, is it red? So that splits our data into no and yes. And then also then we have a, a decision about, is it underlined? Well, yes, these go over here and no, it goes over here. And now we essentially have a decision tree that you know models this data. With microbiome data, what is the decisions? It's essentially usually for each taxa or a specific taxa, it's greater than or less than some value, usually greater than because it's just the opposite on the other branch. So the question, the binary question, you could think about is, hey, is this tax a present or not? That would be, I think that's easier to think about. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. That leads to your conclusion. But usually what the, happens in these nodes is it's literally testing the presence plus like the relative abundance. Like is tax a X over 4.5? And that becomes a part of the decision tree. So obviously that's a single decision tree with like a perfect outcome. So what happens with uh, random forest essentially is it distributes those decision trees over a whole bunch of trees, which are connected. And essentially for each one of those trees, they don't see all of the feature data. They subset the features and they build a decision tree. And then another tree is made with another subset of features so on, so on, so on, with a bunch of parameters around it. And at the end, your ability to say classify something is basically mostly just by taking the average of all those answers across this, essentially a vote. That's pretty, that's about as most straightforward as I can make random force. There's a little bit more to it, obviously, um, but at the heart of it, that's that's how it works. So the other thing to uh, to know uh, that's important is obviously within every machine learning model then is parameters, right? Uh, and some of those parameters you set and sort of forget <laughs> because you like it. And at other times you'll actually sometimes 
iterate over trying to maximize that parameter choice. So for random forests, here's the parameters that are often used. And sometimes the name slightly changes, but this is mostly to give you an idea of the types of things that would go into a random forest prediction. So the number of actual trees uh, in the algorithm to test, right? So more testing requires more time. So it could be a hundred, it could be a thousand. The maximum number of features to use uh, when splitting a node. So that's often set as a square root of the number of features. How many number of leaf nodes is required to split an internal node? The default is one. Uh, maximum depth of the tree. Uh, and you can set that as well. So you can set these parameters ahead of time. The, the trees one is often maybe set because you base it on just how much time you want to wait. And then these other features you could set as the default, or like I just said, you could actually um, try to repeat over multiple parameters and, and, and come up with a solution that way. Uh, and then this is what I've been alluding to a little bit with feature importance. So the nice thing is, is you get a model, you get an accuracy, and then you get this information about what uh, features are important for this uh, prediction. And so the nice thing about this, this is what I kind of like about machine learning, is that these features are, takes into account the relationships between them, right? So it takes into account, you know, what features may occur together um, in that prediction. And so in this case, obviously this is not microbiome data, this is lots of other types of data, uh, but you get back essentially a list ranking the number one feature, number two feature, and so on, so on. And uh, that number that you see for the feature is essentially the uh, amount of accuracy that is lost when you remove that feature from it, from the prediction, from, from the model. So in our case, we could then list uh, different ASVs. If you built the, if you put the feature table in with different uh, families at the family level, you would get back a list of families. Uh, if you combined different types of features, you would get back a list of ranking features that may be important. So during this, um, obviously the assessment, we assess the accuracy. And so uh, usually you just use classical assessments for accuracy, precision, and recall. Uh, and then often all the way that we see these um, accuracies plotted is through a classic uh, rock curve or receiver operator curve. Uh, and essentially all these do is just show off the trade-off between uh, a false positive rate and a true positive rate or precision and recall, depending on what you're exactly doing. And ideally your curve would look, this is, this is very good, <laughs> very good. I'll show you a messy one in the next slide where your predictor is doing really well. And then you can, instead of just um, reporting an accuracy, like I just showed on the previous one, you would report essentially the area under the curve the AUC value, which essentially is literally this area under the curve, which you can sort of equate with accuracy in your head if you'd like, whatever accuracy means by your definition. <laughs> uh, and obviously, so what's that? Area under the curve? Not usually, no. Okay. Yep. Just the value under one? Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't think a percentage would be right. It seems weird. <laughs> I guess you could float your vote. Uh, and then obviously, I guess this dotted line represents kind of the uh, a random prediction for two groups, right? So if we're doing two group prediction, this is like your, hey, if you just take, take guesses, anything above this, anything below this would be actually guessing in the wrong direction. But the dotted line represents a pure guess of a model that's not working very well. So I thought I would just show you um, some real life data that doesn't look too hot, but you know, it's from a published data set and that's, and this is real. So this is not the one I was talking about that I was like, I don't know how I got past reviewers. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I actually really like that paper for different reasons. Um, and so this one actually has, uh, this is just about oral microbiome and whether the oral microbiome of people that previously had cancer, if uh, it was different at a population level. So this was around, uh, this is around a thousand samples in total. And we had another validation data set. So anyway, 
uh, this is nice because I want to show sort of real life what sometimes what bad ones look like and what sort of good ones look like. And so what happens here is you see the curves not very far from the dotted line. And then we have AUC values reported here along with the range. And the range here is because we repeated over, um, over the iteration multiple times. And then why is there different AUCs is just because we tested essentially uh, comparing the model using ASV versus the genus level, and then also using the CLR and relative abundance. And the reason we did that mostly is because sometimes we got overall better predictions with a particular type of normalization method, and other times it performed better uh, at the genus or ASV level. So the take home message here is that when I talk about this scientifically, is that essentially we don't see much signal with breast or prostate, but we do see some limited effect with colon cancer. Uh, and then you could go into the colon cancer feature importance and then talk about those features. Um, does it really matter what the accuracy values are? Not really, because in this case, it, it doesn't really mean much to us. Like often when you think about it, because it's really exciting, because we go, oh, like if this was where we took an oral microbiome sample and we could predict the future, which we actually had in this data set as well, then, you know, you could make big claims that, so if, you know, in the maximum time, in one model, we get to 0.91, right? And my fear is that that's the, that's the number of people will sometimes report, right? Is this like this, of course, we got this one model. So can you see this? At one time with a particular time, we got it up to 0 0.91. Zero <laughs> but, you know, reporting that and then claiming, oh, so at 91%, we can accurately predict cancer is, is problematic, right? Okay, and then the last slide I just want to talk about here um, is just about balanced data sets. I could have brought this up earlier, but it was mostly an afterthought. And just the idea, like if we're testing sort of two groups is our classic thing a lot of times, that having an equal number of samples in both of our categories makes our life a lot easier uh, and makes essentially balanced data sets. If we have a lot more in one group than the other, then we would say those that class is imbalanced. And the reason for that is it makes our interpretation of the accuracy a little bit more tricky. There's a ways to account for it for sure, but you can imagine in my example here where you had 80% of your samples were healthy, 20% had disease. You could build a model essentially that always said everyone's healthy, right? And in the simplest measurement of accuracy, you could say, oh, my model is you know 80% accurate, right? Because it just always says everyone's healthy, but it always gets obviously the diseased ones wrong. <laughs> so that's not good. Uh, obviously you can, you can account for that by accounting for, you know, your accuracy on the disease cases or your precision on the disease for sure. But it helps a lot to have essentially a balanced data set so that you can just look at that dotted line and anything above the dotted line as, a, as, as significantly accurate. Okay, so that is about the most streamlined thing I could give on machine learning. The purpose there is essentially, again, give you a little bit of exposure to it, hear a little bit about random forests. I think it's a topic that uh, machine learning sounds super scary, kind of like statistics maybe, but it is quite powerful. And the reality is, as you'll see, that they're not overly complicated to run. Uh, and then I think the other side of the coin always is a bit of a uh, a reality check of like maybe what's going on under the hood and to be a little bit careful with, with how you use the tools. Okay, any other questions? For this, for my paper? Really? Jacob. Uh, no, he used, uh, I'm pretty sure he used R. Yeah, I would have double checked though. <laughs> Uh, neural uh, I did not test neural networks. We only used random forest. Yep. Um, if you're interested in it, definitely uh, there's R packages. So for random forest, for sure, if you look at carrot or there's wrappers of that. Uh, if you're really into it as well, there's a great package called scikit-learn. I'll post in the Slack for Python. And there's a great amount of documentation there too around that. But essentially, All what's... Right. We cover it in the machine learning. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And basically, what all like the the packages do. Obviously, they implement the algorithm, but like the bigger, harder part is like helping you subset that data, automate that training and validation, and then reporting the accuracy, so you're not doing it all sort of manually yourself. Yeah. Okay.
Great. Hopefully that was a good uh, last teaser. And so with that, uh, that's the end of this session. We obviously have a mo lab module coming up in next, but I think Nia's here because we're going to go out and take another, take a picture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.